always begin in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? Very first verse in scripture. So the very first thing that you begin in your day, in the beginning, God. Sometimes you roll out of bed. Sometimes you literally flop out of bed. What do you do? What's the first thing you do? In the beginning, God. Reading to you from the perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration, word of God, perfectly preserved in English, the final and seventh purification of God's word. The authorized version, commonly referred to as the King James Version. If you happen to have one of these, an authorized version, the King James Version, go ahead and get it. Read along with me today. Read along with me word for word on what we're going to be considering today. Read along with me because sometimes the mouth goes quicker than the brain, like I always say, and also be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. There's some putts out there who brought up, well, the, the Bereans were lost. Yeah, and the lost Bereans, according to your argument, at least they did more than you ever do as far as reading scriptures. Anyway, anyway, Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. See, the authorized version, this is the word of God. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now, the Jesuit trained cemeterians, like that buffoon, Jesuit James White. These ridiculous Jesuit Bible colleges, their premise is, Yea, hath God said. Textual criticism. Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. And right here, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The Jesuit trained cemeterians with their yea hath God said, what the whole thing is that they have people look to them as their final authority. John MacArthur, for example, that puts, um, he is his own authority. Okay, he is his own authority. Okay, Jesuit James White, he is his own authority. You ask any of those two bozos, okay, show me a perfect word of God. Show me. Jesuit James White might go in the direction of all the originals. <laughs> the originals. And when they say the originals, they mean the ones that David literally wrote, that Moses literally wrote, okay? That's what they mean when they say the originals. That golfing idiot who attacked a dear sweet friend, um, he, 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 you know, claiming to be, you know, believing in the scriptures, but then it goes and attacks the scriptures. Ugh. But... And, of course, you can't prove that now because apparently that guy got rid of his other channel. <laughs> uh, yeah, Never mind. But the point is, these guys will bring up this thing about the originals. And when they say the originals, they mean the ones that Moses wrote, that Isaiah wrote. Actually, their hand was the one that did the writing. That's what they mean. Okay, The originals that Moses, David, Malachi, and Nahum wrote... They wore out because they were used. Okay? They were used. We have copies upon copies upon copies. 
And also, when you trace these idiots' logic, these textual criticism idiot, uh, idiots, with their yeah, hath God said, they go to the, they say the originals, which don't exist. And even most of them will admit, well, yeah, they don't exist. So you're saying there's no perfect word of God. Okay, that, that's what they're saying. But they'll also lean towards Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and Aleph, or whatever it's called, the contradictory things, uh, manuscripts, that are held in Rome, that trace back to Antioch, no, excuse me, that trace back to Alexandria, Egypt, the one, the Texas Receptus, is the one that traces on to Antioch, excuse me, excuse me, okay, but the ones that are in Rome, you know, that the oldest and best, they were, they're the oldest, because no one used them, they were junk, they ain't the best, okay, they ain't the best, the ones that are held in Rome, give you, hey, Mr. Murphy, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it like that. You're using a New World Translation <laughs> to try to attack my father. Okay? I can't take you at all seriously when you do something like that. Nor can anybody. Okay? Because you're using a J-Ho translation, you imbecile. Stop that. You want to try to... You really want to try to go against my father? At least have the nerve to try to use what he actually said. But what do they say? Well, we can't understand it. Right? See, the Bibles that come today have their lineage from the manuscripts that come from Rome. Okay? Don't believe what I say. You check that out for yourself. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And I got to tell you, dear friend, I'm going to say this to you because I love you. Okay, if you're going to trust anything Rome says to you, you're stupid. Okay? Don't trust the enemies of Christ, especially for them to give you something that they say God said and he never did. Okay? But see, one of the things that these guys say that the authorized version added words. Okay? Well, when you read actual Hebrew and Greek, um, in from English, they kind of are choppy and blocky. So yeah, they added words like the and stuff like that for sentence flow. Okay, yes, they did do that. That cannot be denied. Okay, but see, that was for the flow within the seventh and final purification of English. It does not diminish from its doctrine that the scriptures teach. And they will throw the same right back at, well, it doesn't do it for the NIV either. Uh, the NIV calls God a liar. Okay? The NIV says that two people killed the same Goliath. Okay? All right? <laughs> okay? Uh, the NIV, I just one off the top of my head, uh, says, uh, doesn't tell you to study, to show yourself approved. The LSD or whatever John MacArthur thing that Jesuit James White, go figure, is defending his fellow Calvinist brother, okay? I saw that uh, t today, looking online, uh, that uh, uh, Jesuit James White is calling the LSD the, uh, the uh, thing that uh, MacArthur wrote, uh, the Bible that he wrote, saying that's superior than the authorized version. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, anyway, but see, the Jesuit trained scholars stem from yea hath God said. Okay? And their whole thing is to get people to look at them. Okay? Because God is spirit, right? How are you supposed to discern from God is spirit? Well, you've got to go to a Jesuit trained cemetery. What to say at the scripture? God is a spirit. The scripture says God is a... Uh, that's from John chapter 4. Go find it. Okay? That's from John chapter 4. God is a spirit. Bible's God is spirit. Well, how do you know which one is which? Oh, that's why you got to go to a Jesuit trained cemetery. Mm -hmm. Who says, yeah, have God said. All right? But see, a lot of these people will also say, well, I can't understand the authorized version. And what do they mean when they say that? 
Hmm? What do they mean? The D's and the Dow's, which... Come on! A fourth grader can understand this! But what's their problem? Now, the deeper things of Scripture, lost people cannot understand. That is true. But see, parts of Scripture are so plain and meant that way so a lost person can come to the Lord. For example, Romans 1, 2, and 3 are there to show the lost sinner you your need for a Savior, that you are not good and that you cannot save yourself. Okay? And I'm telling you, these people who say, well, I can't understand it. You get an opportunity, the Lord gives you, hand feeds you an opportunity to read the scriptures along the Romans road, parts out of one, two, and three, uh, these people will say, well, I can't understand it. Oh, boy, they sure can understand when God, through the scriptures, cuts them to the heart. Oh, yeah, they can surely understand that. I've seen it. Oh, I've seen it. And so have some of you. And remember, a pricking of the heart is like, Oh, men and brethren, what shall we do? When a cutting to the heart is like, ah, ah, you know? The deeper things of Scripture, you need the Lord, obviously. But like I said, Romans 1, 2, and 3. And even the deeper, deeper implications of Romans 1, 2, and 3, the Spirit of truth, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, He will lead you and guide you into all truth. Okay? Yes. But see, Romans 1, 2, and 3 are specific to show you, the lost sinner, <laughs> you in trouble. Okay? You ain't good. You going to hell. Okay? <laughs> All right? <laughs> All right? And that's what Romans 1, 2, and 3 are there for in that context. For you lost, as a lost man, me, as a lost man, the Lord led me to himself through Romans. Okay? All right? And as a lost man who's being broken to smithereens, when you get to Rome, and this is why the, the sleazy believist filth hates it. When you, as a lost man, get to Romans 3, verses 10 on to verse 18, and then you try to seek to reconcile within Scripture and within your own self that you're somewhat good or there's something worth you, God dying for you, you can't. That's what a lot of these people who say, well, I can't understand it. The deeper things, yes, you're right, you can't. <laughs> you need to be saved. But the things that are there for you to understand, it's not that you can't, you just don't want to, boy. Like that Mr. Murphy individual. I will give him respect on this alone. Because when I said to him in a comment, not causing any trouble, I said to him in a comment, if the Lord himself were to appear before you, uh, you wouldn't believe him anyway. And he gave a heart to that comment, and he basically was like, I know. that Why? Because he loves sin more than truth. He loves lie more than truth. Okay? He loves error. Okay? He loves his sin. Okay? That's why. That's why. Okay? It, it's always struck me as so fascinating. You got these people who got the $100,000 pieces of paper on their walls. They, they boast themselves, you know, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. But yet when they come to God's perfect and they're given by inspiration word, they, they can't understand it. And like I said, like I said here, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, like what the scriptures say, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, okay, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The deeper things of Scripture, you need the Lord, obviously. Like I said, like I said, okay. And let me show that to you. Romans chapter 3, the most beloved portion of Scripture to these sleazy Believe as scumbags. Okay? Uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 18. All you guys out there, well, I can't understand the authorized version. I bet you you can understand this. 
as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Boy, that's difficult to understand, isn't it? There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Oh, boy, that's, that's, wow, man, that's breaking my brain to understand that, huh? Yeah. They are all gone out of the way. Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Okay? They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's really hard to understand, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Their throat is an open sepulcher. You don't know what that is? So why don't you look such the scriptures and find out? Or, or, or at least, you know, don't, we're going to touch on this. Go to the beloved. The beloved. Webster's 1828. And look for yourself, okay? All right? Okay, we're going to talk about that a little, a little bit. I mean, praise the Lord. But let's continue, okay? Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asps is under their lips. Wow, that's, wow, that's so difficult. Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness... Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Why is that? There is no fear of God before their eyes. I've seen this. When you get to someone uh, on the Romans road, you know, you start with Romans 1. You know, telling, showing them, especially Romans chapter 1, the, the lost sinner, the Lord opens up a door. You always have the scriptures on you. Always have the scriptures on you. Always be ready like that. I spared you. That's happened to me once. It only took one time for me to learn from that one. Boy. Once. That happened to me once. I didn't have the scriptures on me. I wasn't uh, didn't have anything really memorized or anything like that. I was still a babe, okay, as it were. Ever since. I, I go out to get my mail. <laughs> I have the scriptures on me. I go to take the garbage out. I have the scriptures on me. You do the same, saint. Okay? You do the same. But see, when you lead someone down the Romans road, the deeper things, yes, you need the Lord. But Romans 1, 2, and 3 specifically are there to show you lost sinners that you're in danger. You're going to go to hell unless the Lord saves you. And see, Romans 1, 2, and 3 are there specifically to break you of your self-righteousness. Which is why Satan's religion, Roman Catholicism, and all her daughters hate the Romans road. Even Elmer from New York said that the Romans road was the road to hell. Oh, gee, I wonder why that guy would say something like that. Give me a break, okay? Give me a break. It's not that these people can, can't understand, I mean, like we've already addressed, but the things that are there that are needful, that they can't understand, it's not that they can't, they don't want to. If God said, you shall be as God, so good and evil. And then in Proverbs, excuse me, in Psalms 12, Psalms 12, verses 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. What's to them? The words, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. You get a Bible, like an NIV or the LSD thing from... <laughs> that's not its name, but I can't remember and I don't care to. Uh, the LSD thing that John MacArthur wrote and that, that stupid twit, the Jesuit coadjutor, the Jesuit James White uh, recommends that says it's superior to the scriptures. Hey, hey, hey. You check the Bibles. They, they messed this up. Oh, why? Because in the scriptures, the scriptures are telling you that God's going to preserve his word. And a furnace of earth seven times is very significant. 
the Word of God went through a seven purification pro uh, process of language. Now, those of you saints out there, you will recognize that, well, Brad, you got that from Ruckman. Yes, I did. I don't trust Peter Ruckman. I don't think we're going to see him when we get up there. Hey, if I'm wrong, give me that humble pie and serve up the crow. Let's go. Let's, I'll, I'll eat it. Let's, let's do it. If he's up there, like I said, let me have, can I have extra with that crow? Can I have extra of that humble pie? Like, you know, if Luther is up there, give me the crow, I'll eat it, I don't care. Okay? I don't think neither of them are going to be up there. But hey, if I'm wrong, we'll find out, won't we? Yeah, we will. But, yes, I got that from Peter Ruckman. But see, here's, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When Peter Ruckman gave that evidence, you know what I did? I searched it out on my own. Okay? I spent hours looking that up myself. Okay? What Mr. Rachman said about the seven purifications of the scriptures was right. Okay? Gotta give it, gotta give the credit where it's due. Even if I don't like the guy or trust him, he spoke truth, I acknowledge truth. Okay? Preference in that is irrelevant. Okay? Okay? If they speak the truth, they speak the truth. Period. But the seven purifications of the languages, the furnace of earth, that the scriptures, the word of God went through, are thus. Hebrew, number one. Aramaic. Greek. Koine Greek, not modern Greek. Old Syriac. Old Latin. Now there's there's this thing with the Latin. There's uh, uh, the Latin of the Texas Receptus, or something like that doesn't match Jerome or something like that. I have that written down somewhere else. But uh, the Old Latin. And interesting to note, they called it the Dark Ages. And come on, even most of these, even these kids in the Jesuit schools know what the Dark Ages are. But you know why they were called the Dark Ages? They were called the Dark Ages because the Roman Catholic Church kept the scriptures from the common people. The only way you could get the scriptures was if you were versed in Latin. Okay? Latin. And you could watch videos online of these masses where the Catholic priests, priests say Lucifer, uh, Lucifer, okay? All right, the Catholic Church is, church is Satan's church, okay? They openly, brazenly worship Satan, okay? All their little saints are all these pagan gods uh, hidden under the veil of what they call Christianity, okay? Rome is Satan's church, period, okay? Period. The sixth language, German. The seventh is English. So, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Old Syriac, Old Latin, German, English. The seven purifications of furnace of earth, seven languages that the Word of God went through to arrive at the perfect standard King James Version. Check out his channel too. Really good stuff. Uh, uh, an enemy of Rome. An enemy of Rome and a brother who's unfortunately done, jumped off the, the earth or something. But whatever. Okay? He's got his, he's got his stuff going on. Okay? But the seven purifications that the Word of God went through to arrive at the perfect Okay. Seven. It has ended in English. And see, what the Jesuit trained cemeterian, who says, Yeah, have God said, they say you gotta go to the Greek or the Hebrew. Okay. Which one? See, the purifications onto the seventh language were stepping stones. Okay? 
stepping stones to arrive at this. Okay? You do not go, I believe, that you do not go to the, because what do they say? The Jesuit trained cemeterians say what? You're saying people need to learn English to know what God says. Oh, shut up! You're saying that they got to learn Koine Greek and Scriptural Hebrew to maybe have an idea of what God said. Okay? You take your argument and wipe betwixt your buttocks with it, pal. Okay? You throw that right in their face right away when they say that to you. It's like, oh, you shut up. Seriously. Seriously. You talk about a circular thing there, man. To, to, to chase my buttocks. Now, I ran into that recently, you know. Oh, you say you guys learn English. And I like, <laughs> like, went off on them. That, that, that just drives me crazy, man. I like, you shut up. Shut up. No. This is the final purification. Here it is. Okay? Hey, Macadoodle, Mark Arthur, and Jesuit James, okay? Here's, a per here's the perfect word of God. Here's the perfect standard. Throw away your NIV. Hey, Murphy, will you just get rid of that stupid New World Translation? Okay? If that's the reason why you hate God, that... <laughs> dude, dude. Hey, yeah, I know you're a big shot and you're, you know, <laughs> satanic atheist, dude. You want to talk? I'll talk to you. Okay? But here's the perfect Word of God. It's right here. And the Word of God went through seven purifications to arrive at this. You don't go to the Hebrew or the Greek to translate the Word of God into other tongues. You go to the preserved. You go to the English. And you use the authorized version. And then they bring up the same arguments. Like, well, there are words in English that don't translate into other languages. You're right. You're right. But see, that doesn't subtract from what you base your foundation upon. The Scripture. How many um, uh, Nestle Alans are there now? Something like still, is it still 28? What was it, 18 or 19 editions of the Texas Receptus? What, where's the, where's the defining line in that? Huh? And then in the English, right? Have you, have you actually tried to read old English like, Matthew's Bible, as it was called, or um, uh, Tyndale or Coverdale or whatever it is, uh, his uh, New Testament. Whoa, <laughs> whoa. I mean, I got myself, I got me the, uh, what is that, the uh, 1560 Geneva Bible, uh, edited and produced basically by Calvin and has a, a lot of Calvinistic doctrine and through and you uh, the one video about Calvinists we demonstrate how they mess up Ephesians chapter one and something or something like that so he can twist his predestination doctrine okay all right the authorized version is God's perfect and errant given by inspiration word of God. This is the most attacked book on the planet. Okay? All the scriptural attacks that come against this by the yea hath God said crowd. Okay? You go to the, I mean, I've talked to these people that have come out of these uh, cemetery schools and their faith is destroyed by what? Yea hath God said. Okay? What, what do they attack? What do they base their attacks on? Just with James White. His, he's, he's saying the LSD thing by John MacArthur. <laughs> it's super. People, okay, y y yeah, yeah. Just with James White is entertaining. Okay, sure, I, yeah, I'll give you that. I, I have watched that, that grotesque pond scum. I have, I have. Um, he, he does have an air of sarcasm that's humorous. Okay, I'll give him that. Okay, I'll give him that. But the guy is a devil. He's leading people to hell. He is, I have no doubt, a Jesuit. Okay. And remember, Mr. Smiley called him a brother. Uh, you can verify that if it's still on his channel. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Jesuit James White is a Jesuit. Absolutely. Well, he doesn't have a paper trail, Mr. Smiley himself said that to me via email, okay? 
Mr. Smiley, David Daniels at Chick Publications, okay, he said that to me via email, okay? There's no paper trail to prove that James White is a Jesuit. I wish I had that. I, I, I wish I still had the, in the <laughs> myriad of the things of my emails, I wish I still had that. Because I would. I would put that for you people to see. There's no paper trail. It's like, Dude, of all people who ought to know that that is a bunk argument. Okay? If the Jesuits don't want a paper trail to, uh, to keep one of their owns hidden, uh, they ain't going to be a paper trail, you dummy. Okay? Come on. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Verses 7 on to verse 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. Where do you get the law and the testimony from? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honeycomb, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. What is he talking about? And where do you get these things? Look up Psalm 19 in a Bible. You messed that up. See, Satan does that. Messes everything up. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me. Thou is singular, by the way. Okay? Cleanse thou me from, the, from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let, not them, let them not have dominion over me. Then, I, then shall I be upright and shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Okay? See, God promised to preserve his word. He already saw it. And he chose English, the authorized version. But herein is where the, the issue comes. Okay? Here is where the issue comes. God never once said that he was going to preserve the English language in and of his, itself. But God said he was going to preserve his word and he chose English, authorized version. But see, what has happened is going to read a little from uh, George Orwell's 1984. Okay? If you've never taken the time to read uh, George Orwell's 1984, you should. You should. Um, this guy was obviously working for somebody. Uh, was he an, a Jesuit? I don't know. Um, was he a Mason? Probably. Uh, if he was associated with the Illuminati... Uh, then he was associated with the Jesuits uh, because Illuminati, Adam Weissop, okay, um, uh, Mr. Bruce Leaf, he recently did a really, had a, some really good uploads on his channel uh, going on uh, about that stuff. Good, okay. But if you've never read 1984, I suggest you do. I suggest you do. Because a lot of what is going on here, <laughs> but when it comes to words, See, in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, you compare that, I, I personally would like, I would personally like to get the newest edition of a Webster's Dictionary, which has dough, you know, from uh, uh, Simpson, dough, you know, they have that in the, uh, but whatever. I have a, an older or newer um, collegiate one. I have taken that, and when I had the compact Webster's, and I laid them side by side and compare words and see 
how words have changed their meaning. And see, because Satan uses euphemistic language, okay, because Satan will do things to change the definition and meaning of words. Look what they did with the Jesuit psychological operation known as the poison crown that they pulled on everyone a couple of years ago. I mean, you can see it right before your eyes how they're changing the definition of words. Okay? So what happens is English language, the English language has been perverted. Okay? From where it was at its infancy and its purest. Okay? And it was in that where our Lord preserved his word. But see, Satan has gone about to change the meaning of words. So when these Bible... Have you ever read anything out of the message? Okay? I, I mean, just, just, just for yourself. I've read stuff out of the message. I've actually... What was it? I, I think I read um, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and some of Matthew. I think... I, I, I did. I, and I got a copy of the message myself. Okay? You read that Sermon on the Mount, as is above, so below. The guy's got Crowley's statement right there. Okay? But see, what's going on? Satan has changed the meaning of words in English. So these people from the Vatican come and give you a new Bible with the modern definition of words? Okay? All right? That's why I'm a stickler. If you wanted to find a word in English pertinent on the scripture, you start here, okay? You start in the scriptures. This, the perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration word of God. Okay? You're not going to go wrong here. You might go wrong in your understanding, but you're not going to go wrong from the scripture itself. You're not. Okay? You start here. And if you have questions or something, more things, then you go to uh, beloved Noah. Okay? Then you go. You start in Scripture first, boy. But what has Satan done? I'm reading to you from uh, 1984, where, where my fingers are right here. All right, right here, my uh, left hand. Okay? This is what I'm going to be reading you, if you can. Okay? Right there where my fingers are. Go ahead and pause that and read it, if you can. Okay? It is, it's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Get, get a Webster's 1828 in the modern dictionary and compare them. You'll see it. Of course, the great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives. Okay? But there are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. And this, you see, <laughs> this principle you see in these idiots with the woke movement and the gender nonsense. You really do. You really do. You see this principle being applied. Okay? It, it isn't only the synonyms. There are also antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word which is simply the opposite of some other words? A word contains its opposite in itself. Take, I, I, I like this, listen to this. Take good for an instance. If you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? Ungood. There is no good, there is no evil, there's only shades of gray. See, what is he describing here? He's describing euphemistic language which we have addressed I, I can offhand find them uh, find the videos but uh, we have addressed euphemistic language uh, quite extensively uh, I, I don't like euphemistic language neither should you okay okay what need is there for a word like bad ungood will do just as well ungood which is different from bad euphemistic language. Okay, ungood will do as well. Better! Because it's an exact opposite, which the other is not. Or again, if you want a stronger version of good, what sense is there in having a whole string of vague, 
useless words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them plus good covers the meaning or double plus good if you want something stronger still of course we use those forms already but in the final version of new speak there'll be nothing else in the end the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words in reality only one word don't you see the beauty of that Winston it was Big Brother's idea originally of course he added as an afterthought Big Brother BB uh, what's that it says what order <laughs> okay was that what he was talking about maybe not but today give me a break and this was written in what the, uh, the, the what was this written in the 30s okay this is very pertinent for today you you pay attention I mean if you have in the news what they did how the news media used language euphemism how they employed this very thing when the Jesuit order let loose their psychological operation known as the poison crown look up the word poison crown in Latin and you'll see what I'm saying okay well, you, you got to be careful around here on YouTube because you touch a sacred calf they'll zing you for it so got to be careful okay also, another quote here from, let's see, also where my fingers are, the yellow stuff right here. This is what we're going to be reading. I'm going to be reading you right here. Pause it and read it if you can. Take a screenshot. Okay. Do, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of of thought. Narrow the range of thought. Well, how many genders are there? Isn't that broadening the thought? Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. See how that works? It's making it narrow by that it's diverting from it. In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word. With its meaning rigidly defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten, Already in the 11th edition. And think about these Bibles too. Who keep getting redefined and redefined. And the, the, the Jesuits are, well, the, the King James. They did that for spelling, grammar, stuff like that. Like I said, I mean, uh, you read a 1611. They have like I spelled differently uh, twice in the same verse okay and also stuff like that okay nothing like what they're doing in the Vatican today okay so don't fall for that one, okay already in the 11th edition we're not far from that point but the process will still be continually continuing long after you and I are dead and it's going on today every every year fewer and fewer words and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. And a fool is known by the multitude of words. And when you have a jarbled mess, God is not the author of confusion. Even now, of course, there's no reason to excuse, no reason or excuse for committing thought crimes. It's merely a question of self-discipline, reality control. <laughs> yeah. But in the end, there won't be any need for that. There won't be any, okay, 
But in the end, there won't be any need even for that. The revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. A genderless and ambig uh, lang language filled with ambiguity. Okay? A language stripped of meaning with no clear cut. Like I heard um, the Star Wars nonsense satanic stuff, one of them said that the bad guys were called Sith. Okay? You know, S I T H, Sith, is in the scriptures. But they said only a Sith deals in absolutes. Hmm. Now, you just roll that around for a moment, and you can find that quote from that Hollywood, that Hollywood nonsense, Star Wars. Okay? You can find that. It's like, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Only bad people deal in absolutes. Saints deal with absolutes. Christians don't. Atheists don't. And they're the bad guys. Oh, excuse me. They're the ungood guys, huh? New speak is Ingo Sock, and Ingo Sock is New Speak. Let me, t let me put that in a different translation for you. New Speak is Jesuit, and Jesuit is New Speak. It, it says, uh, Ingo, I don't know if you can see that. I, it says Ingo, Ingo, Ingo Sock right there. I just messed with it, okay? He added with a sort of mystical satisfaction. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, at, very, at the very least, not a single human being will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we are having now. You ever seriously try to talk with some of the millennial kids today? Hmm? The Sacrita Monita, one of the translations or editions of it. I have uh, three or four of them, I think. The Secreta Monita, the secret instruction of the Jesuits. The audiobook version of that, read by me, uh, and also Brother Alexander Hartley on his channel. He's got a extensive um, rendering of him reading the same one, not this one, because this one's here and he's got his own. <laughs> but uh, you can, if you want to hear the Secreta Monita, uh, if, if you can't, you can get it off of Amazon or whatnot, okay? But I want to, I've shared this with you before, but with, in light of what we're talking about, I want to read this to you, okay? The Sacrita Monita. Chapter, what is this? 17? 5, 6, 7, yeah. 17. The Sacrita Monita. Of the methods of advancing the society. The Jesuit order. In the first place, it is incumbent on all that even in the smallest and even in the first place, it is incumbent on all that even in things of small moment, they should always think alike, or at least that they speak so outwardly. And you look at our enemies, they, uh, they work really hard to do that. For thus, whatever disturbances there may be in the affairs of this world, the society may always, of necessity, be increased and strengthened. Hmm. Take your part, brother. Take your part. Okay. Therefore, let all endeavor to shine by doctrine and example that other religious orders, especially the clergy, pastors, etc., may be surpassed and at length 
the common people may wish all religious offices to be discharged by us only. And indeed, let it be said openly that they do not require so much teaching in pastors, but rather that they should discharge their duties well. For the society is able to assist by counsel, and on that account it holds study in the highest esteem. But what are you studying? What they provide. <laughs> what they provide. Not the scriptures. Kings and princes must be encouraged in this doctrine that in the present state it is impossible for the Catholic faith to subsist without the political or civil power. Okay? Hey, find separation of church and state within the Constitution. Find it for me. In order you'll find that, you'll find a reference to that in the Federalist Papers. But find that for me in the Constitution. You know, that Jesuit, excuse me, not Jesuit, that free Masonic document, our Constitution. The free Masonic document, not Jesuit. Okay? Let's continue here. But in this, the greatest discretion is necessary. For this reason, our people must render themselves agreeable to the great, that they may be consulted on the most secret matters. They will be able to assist them with the newest, choicest, and most genuine transcripts from everywhere. Oh, now think about that one in light of the Bibles. New and improved edition of this. New and an updated. Yeah, we're providing them with the newest choices and most genuine. Yeah, the oldest and best. You have that right here in the secret instructions of the Jesuits. Okay? And you can apply that to how Rome gives you the Bibles when God is the one that gave you the scriptures. Well, they said, well, Erasmus, yes, Erasmus compiled the uh, the. Uh, the Texas Receptus or whatever. Yes, he did. But Rome never used what he compiled. Excuse me. They never used. There is not a Textus Receptus edition of a Bible come from Rome. People will say, well, the New King James, that's a blending of Antiochian and Alexandrian. It is not specifically either or. It's a mix. Okay? There is not a Texas Receptus edition from Rome. It does not exist. Okay? Neither will it be of small advantage if the dissensions of great men and princes are cautiously and secretly fomented, kept going. Okay, that's one of the things that these devils do. They like to keep things going, picking at scabs. Okay? Even with the mutual ruin of their power, but if any probability of a reconciliation is perceived, the society must as soon as possible endeavor to pacify them, lest it should be forestalled by some other person. The belief that the society was instituted by a special divine providence. Boy, that sounds almost kind of Calvinistic, doesn't it? According to the prophecies of the abbot jo 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 Joachim, in order that the church, depressed by heretics, may be raised, must by every means be implanted, especially in the populace and the nobility. Yeah, and Christian, Christianity, Christianity, Catholicism. Then the favor of great men and bishops having been obtained, the pastorates and canonaries must be seized, in order to a more thorough uh, reformation of the clergy who live formally under certain rules with their bishops and tended to perfection. And lastly, must we must aspire to abbacies and bishoprics, which having regard to the listlessness and stupidity of the monks, may be easily acquired when they are vacant. 
overtake everything like they have. Okay? For certainly it would be altogether to the benefit of the church, and they mean Rome, if all bishoprics were held by the society, and even the apostolic chair may be possessed. Yes! The Jesuits are Catholicism. Francis is a Jesuit. Francis is subservient to Arturo Sosa. Arturo Sosa, the black pope, is the head of Rome. He is the most dangerous, deadliest, most powerful man on earth today. Arturo Sosa. Okay. Francis bows to Sosa. Okay. Especially if the people, especially if the pope should be made a temporal prince of all good things. Wherefore, for every reason, let the temporal temporalities of the society be by degrees extended, yet prudently and secretly, and there cannot be any doubt that there will then be a golden age and continuous and universal peace, and consequently the divine blessing will attend the church. And of course, they're making a reference when the body of Christ is redeemed, caught up, and then Satan gets his seven years to rule and reign in Rome and whatnot, and whatever, okay? But, if there should be no hope of attaining this, as indeed it is necessary that offenses will come, it will be necessary to change our political position according to the time and to urge princes who are friendly with us to mutual and cruel wars that thus everywhere the society may be solicited and employed for public reconciliation. Everybody's going to Rome. Okay? Everybody goes to Rome. Okay? All roads lead to Rome. Abandon Christianity. Okay? Abandon Christianity. They're not all going to smoke and joke. They're not all going to Israel to the head rabbi. They're not even going to the head imam of the of Ishmael. Who's doing this? Who do they go to? Well, that the promoters of the common good, we may be compensated by the principal benefices and ecclesiastical dignities. I, I, it says here, I like this, that they will change our, their political position. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Finally, let the society endeavor at least to effect this, that having gained the favor and authority of princes, they may at least be feared by those who do not love them. Like I said, the Secreto Monita audio book will be in the description box for you. Okay? <sighs> you know, reading that, I'm kind of tired. Am I tired? Hmm. Tired. Hmm. Tired. Webster's 1828 to change. Tired. I'm tired. No. I'm weary. I'm weary. I'm not tired. Brad, what are you talking about? Oh, Brad, are you striving about words again? Some lying devil uh, infiltrator who who's pretty good at words himself, but uses them to protect himself because he's an infiltrator. He's lost! He's lost! Okay? But 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This has been leveled at me quite a few times. Okay? Oh, you're all going on about Christian. Christian is Catholic. I'm not a Catholic, buddy. Uh, what it might have once meant is not what it means now. Okay? All right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. He is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, 
perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. And people have said, well, Brad, you're doting about words. Words are important. Words have meaning. And when you discover that God who preserved his word in English, that the word that God uses in his, the English word in his word, has been changed, which one do you go by? What is our standard? And go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 on to verse 19. And there will be a video in the description box where we cover this in depth. Okay? Because subverting. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 on to verse 19. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit. Profit. But to the subverting of the hearers. Words to no profit today are, you have to keep the law today to be saved. Okay? All right? Words to no profit are today that there is no such thing as once saved, always saved. Okay? Those are examples of words to no profit according to the scripture. Okay? Prove it to you. And like I said, the video for that, which is a response to a heretic, uh, will be in the description box for you too. It's uh, R-E uh, subverting souls. Okay? There's a profit to trying to align our, our speech with God's word. There's a profit to it. Okay? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So someone who's striving about words to no profit are people who are not doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Trying to take things from other dispensations and make them applicable today. Whether it's from the law or from the time of Jacob's trouble, like that lying fart guy does, okay? Or like Mark the Messenger does. Those are examples of people who are, are, who are doing exactly this, striving about words to no profit. Okay, that's what that is talking about. We, we cover that in the video, which will be in the description box for you. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word, Mark the Messenger, and lying heart, okay, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Resurrection is past already, meaning they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. See, the Lord saves you. You come to him on his terms today, uh, broken and contrite and in fear of him. You call upon his name. He seals you with himself. You're once saved, always saved. Okay? You cannot become unsealed because it's not your salvation. It's his. Okay? But... Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And, of course, uh, what's the ultimate follow-through on this? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You can also reference the Sermon on the Mount where our Lord says about the, the thing about building your house on a rock versus sand. But for us today, pertinent uh, uh, doctrinally and dispensationally, because you got to remember, Sermon on the Mount, ah, beautiful for instruction in righteousness. Doctrinally, it's not for us today. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 7 on to verse 11. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Okay? <laughs> uh, because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God doesn't dwell in church buildings, people. Okay? 
according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Foundation? Yeah. And another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth, buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So, see, the authorized version is the perfect and errant given by inspiration word of God. God breathed. This, the scriptures, the King James Version, tells you of the real actual Jesus Christ who is God the Father. You know, the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that spirit. One God comprised of spirit, soul, and body just like you and I are. We are comprised of spirit, soul, and body. We're not little Christs. We're not little gods. Okay? But we have a spirit, soul, and body because we're made in the image of God in that respect. Okay? This is God's word. Okay? You can trust this. You can't trust a Bible. You can't. You can't. That is why I am adamant about distinction. Okay? And you can go ahead and say, no, Brad, you're making... Uh, yeah, I am making a big deal out of this. Because I've put this into practice. I've seen the fruit of it. And that's it. Okay? That's it. I'm sorry. I'm tired. I'm tired. What is that? What are you talking about, Brad? I'll show you. Tired from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. There's quite a bit here, and we're going to read, um, we're going to read, we're going to read quite a bit of it. All right. Tire. A tier, a row, or rank. Thus, this is the same word as tier, differently written, okay? Two, a headdress. And you're going to see, that's what it is. But I wanted to start here for you, because a lot of you, it's like, because we use this word tired quite a bit. I, I've been using it recently until, until... A dear brother and I, our dear brother is like, ask the question. So like, well, let's find out. And I'm glad we did. Okay? A headdress, something that encompasses the head. Ezekiel, and we'll, we'll look at this. Three, furniture. Apparatus as the tire of war. Four, a tire. Five, a band or hoop of iron used to bind the fellies Fellies of wheels to secure them from wearing and breaking as cart tire, wagon tire. This tire, however, is generally formed of different pieces and is not one entire hoop. Cart tire, bicycle tire. Okay? And a headdress around a round head tire, okay? Where they come up with, the, I don't know, but the roundness thereof, I, I would reckon. Let's continue, okay? Tire, to adorn, to attire, to dress as the head, okay? Now, see, in this right here, Webster has the right definition of tire according to Scripture. But see, the English language in and of itself changes, okay? Webster's 1828 is a more purer form of the English language. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because like I said, I'd love to get a 2023 edition of Webster's. I know you can get it online, but it's so much better to have like this one here and that one there. I would love to. Okay. You know, that's, and, 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 brethren, that don't. Okay? Don't. I'm just saying. I, I wouldn't mind having this and having the newest Webster's and comparing and just seeing how and that allows for what we have already looked at in 1984. See? Tire. To fail. 
Indeed, terrene signifies to tar, to pine, to waste or consume, to di digest is weariness. I can't even read that good. Okay. To weary. To weary. As we, I'm tired. I'm tired. Hmm. I don't know how the etymology or whatever of the word tire went from being something, and you're going to see this in the scripture, that is worn on the head. The second definition that Mr. Webster does give. Okay? I don't know where they get from that to that. I don't understand. But, whatever. Okay? To weary, to fatigue, to exhaust the strength by toil or labor. It's weary. Okay? It's weary. Okay? As to tire a horse or an ox. A long day's work in summer will tire the laborer. To weary, to fatigue, to exhaust the power of attending, or to exhaust patience with dullness or tediousness. A dull advocate may tire the court and jury and injure his cause. To tire out, to weary, or fatigue, to excess, to harass, tire, to become weary, to be fatigued. To have the strength fail, to have the patience exhausted, a feeble body soon tires without, with hard labor. Tired, wearied, fatigued, tiredness, the state of being, being weary, weariness. And then you got tiresome, but we're not going to go there. You get the point, okay? Now we're not going to look up weary, but rather we're going to use the scriptures. Okay? We're going to use the scriptures. Now, you heard what now, you got to remember this about Mr. Webster. And our brother brought up this, and this is a great point. Mr. Webster was not making a dictionary specifically for the saints. He was making a dictionary of the English words and their usage at the time, 1828, okay? He was not, he added scriptural words and definitions, yes, but that was not his main premise. He was encompassing other things. You have to, excuse me, I have to remember that so we don't unjustly accuse Webster. Now, whether or not we're going to see Noah Webster up there, I have no uh, clue. He was a Calvinist, uh, as I believe, or whatever. I don't know. We'll find out. Okay? His dictionary, I highly recommend it. I use it. Okay? Absolutely. But Mr. Webster has blown it, botched it on many things. There will be a couple of videos. Another example. Fast. We use the word fast as equating to speed. You look in the scripture. Fast has nothing to do with speed in Scripture, our perfect standard. Oh. Well, Brad, you're making... Are you going to go to hell if you want to continue to use the word fast instead of speedily or hastily or hasty? Are you going to go to hell if you want to use the word tired instead of wearied or be weary? No. No. Are you going to go to hell if you're going to refer to that man of sin as the Antichrist? No. no. Here's the thing. If you are one of these King giant bible eating Christians that say that our speech ought to align here the best we can, but yet flippantly disregarded because, well, they don't understand. The Lord rebuke you, and you go pound some sand, take a long walk off of a short pier. Okay? Okay? You make mistakes. But what do you do? What do you do when Scripture says something and the beloved... Webster says something else. 
Now Webster, we saw for tired, he had he had the right definition in there. But there was all this fluff. And we're going to see. We're going to see. First Kings chapter 9. Why are we doing this? To show you that we have a perfect standard. And to also show you that God chose English. And in English, his word is preserved in the authorized version. But see, Satan has degraded English and has given you Bibles in modern American English, such as the mess and stuff like that. Okay? And see, with the people will come to the scriptures with the modern interpretation of these words and try to apply that onto the scriptures and get off because they're using something from a modern definition from something other than what the Lord used that word to define. Do you get it? I just, that's pretty, yes, that's pretty simple. Okay? It's like, you know, Mr. Murphy, again, okay, again, you're going to be sitting there reading out of a New World Translation, trying to debunk God. Dude, dude, of course, you, I mean, I mean, yeah, you're using a piece of trash. Hey, Mr. Murphy, I dare you to try to do that from the scriptures. Do it from the scriptures. But if you do that, remember, then, then you and I, then I'm going to have to, yeah, and I will. Kind of like stupid head little Christy Burke, you know, using the Bible to try to debunk God. And you see that in a lot of atheists. And they take modern, the newest, Choices transcripts, like we saw from the Sacrita Monita, and try to apply the newer definitions to the words where God has specific ways he used the English language to preserve his word. First Kings chapter 9, one verse, verse 30. First appearance of any variation of the word. First appearance. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 30. Uh, where am I? Oh, one second, one second. I wrote something down wrong. <laughs> I, 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 I despise when I do that. I accidentally wrote down 1 Kings instead of 2 Kings. Because you went to 1 Kings, Brad, there isn't a... I know. 2 Kings... Chapter 9, verse 30. Second Kings, chapter 9, verse 30. I wrote down First Kings by accident. Sorry. Second Kings, chapter 9, verse 30. First appearance of this word in any variation. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel, oh boy, type of the Roman Catholic Church, the uh, feminazi woman who manipulated her husband uh -huh, heard of it and she painted her face, put war paint on, and tired her head and looked out a window. Tired her head. Hmm. Tired her head. Interesting. Isaiah chapter 3. So with that first appearance, we saw what? Tired and we saw head. Remember that. Head. Tired. Okay? Some would like to be cute and be like, well, you're mentally... Isaiah 3. Did I write that one down right? <laughs> Isaiah 3. We want verses 16 on to verse 24. Isaiah 3, verse 16 on to verse 24. Yes, I did. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. Now, pay attention to this context. Are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with, the, with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will discover their secret parts. 
in that day, the Lord will take away the bra now pay attention, the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. There you see the roundness and tire right there. Context. Tire. Tires. Tire. Tires. Has something to do with an ornamental thing in this context. Okay? The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. What are we reading to? Verse 24. And it, and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. And burning instead of beauty. So, tired. Jezebel tired her head. Okay? She put on war paint and did something with her head. Here we see tires in, thing, in relation to some kind of ornamental thing. Okay? Ezekiel, the final two appearances of, this, of the variations of this word. 24, Ezekiel 24, verses 15 on to verse 24. Also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind thee, tire of thine head upon thee. There's a reference to the head again. Okay? And you see a binding the tire of thine head. Binding the tire. Jezebel bind, did, tired her head. And we saw in Isaiah that tires or something like that or tired or whatever, it's something ornamental. Like Mr. Webster said. Yes, he did. He had, yes, he did. He had the accurate uh, scriptural definition of the word in there. Yes, he did. But he added some other things that scripturally don't allow for. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tire of thine head upon thee, and put on thy shoes upon thy feet, and cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. And the people said unto me, Wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us that thou doest? Then, answer, then I answered them. Word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Speak unto the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth. And your sons and your daughters, whom ye have left, shall fall by the sword. And ye shall do as I have done. Ye shall not cover your lips, or eat the bread of men. And your tires shall be upon your heads, the final appearance of any variation of this word, okay? And your shoes upon your feet. Ye shall not mourn nor weep, but ye shall pine away for your iniquities, and mourn one toward another. So, tire, tires, tired. Scripturally, has zero, zilch, zip, nada to do with exhaustion or weariness. We saw even in one of the definitions in Webster, he uses the word weary, weariness. And you're like, well, Brett, so what? Well, is this your perfect standard? 
It is? Good. Are you one of them, then, who says, well, we should make our script, our line, our words, excuse me, try to line up with scripture the best we can? Okay, then. If that is your mentality, what do you do with this, then? What do you do with it? Like, fast. Fast, scripturally, has nothing to do with speed. Nothing. Nothing at all. That, that'll be in the description box for you. Brad, you're... Kayate. Are you going to go to hell <coughs> if you want to use the other... One? No, no, but, okay. You believe in the authorized version of the scriptures. You are a saint of the church of God, which is the church of the living God. Okay? You're a saint. You hold to the authorized version of the scriptures. Our speech ought to align with scripture the best it can. What do you do with this? What do you do with it? What do you do? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm not going to use that word out of the scriptural context. Just like worry. Worry, number one, is not in scripture. But scripture defines worry as fretting. Fast. You know, hurried, hasting, speedily. Okay? What do you do? It's not that big of a deal. Maybe not to you. But when words, as you are seeing in society, being diluted and you claim you claim that this is your standard we gotta make a stand sometime brother well you're you're fighting about that yeah and how many people are how many times are you out there talking to people hmm? have you have you even attempted have you even attempted Christian, Christian, have you even tried to remove that from your vocabulary other than to debunk it? Have you ever, have you even tried? Oh, the majority says, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means if the majority says something, but that must make it right. What do you do? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Go to Genesis chapter 27. So, okay, Brad. Okay. What do we say? Weary. Now, in Scripture, there's where, where, and weareth. Weary. What's the root of weary? Where, right? But see, in Scripture, wear. Wear a rough garment to deceive, right? They, they wear, wear a rough garment to deceive. Or they wear away the stones. So, to look up weary, beginning with wear, isn't actually applicable. Because, they, like I said, they wear a rough garment to deceive. The water wears the stones. Okay? Weareth. Okay? He weareth a tunic. The waters weareth the stones. It's not how we go about it. Okay? It's not how we go about it this way. This is not the first appearance of the variation. This one is really clear. And this is what we use. This is what ever since uh, I wanted to do this yesterday, but things happened. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to do this yesterday, but yesterday wasn't today. Today, or the day. Today is the day. Not do the wrong bread. Genesis 27. Genesis 27. So, okay, Brad, you're saying, saying, shouldn't you? And hey, I'm not saying that if you're going to continue to use these words, not according to the scriptural context, I am not saying you are lost. I'm not even saying you're a heretic. 
Okay, I'm not saying that. The point is, we claim to have a perfect standard, and we do. We do. And when the perfect standard that we live our life by shows us that we're using something in the wrong way, we ought to give our best efforts as we are able and can to align ourselves with that standard. Right? Come on. Even, even you devils have to, at least for the facade, be, okay, yeah, you're right. If you don't want to do that and be lazy about it, fine. Is that going to send you to hell? No. Are you necessarily a heretic? No. But if we claim a standard, and the standard says one thing, and everything else says something else, oh, what do we do? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, it's not that big of a deal. Maybe not to you. But see, when the Lord opens up something and shows me something, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Like I said, with our, our brother, Brother Alexander, he's like, well, what's the difference between tired and worry? And he's like, well, let's find out. We had a little scripture study. It's like, wow, man. You know, and that's here we are. Genesis 27, verse 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Weary of my life. Deuteronomy 25 now. Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25. We will be looking at the very first appearance of any variation of this word. Yes, we will be. Yes, yes we will be. Okay. As far as this thing as exhausted, spent. Okay. That kind of thing. Deuteronomy 25 verse 17 on to verse 19. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary. Faint, weary. Faint, weary. Okay? Exhausted. Spent. Drained. Uh, exasperated. Like what we saw in Genesis chapter 27. You know, Rebecca's like, my life was weary because of the daughters of Heth. Weary. Annoyed. Okay? Certain devils weary me. Okay? <laughs> As they do others. Okay? Are you tired? I'm weary. I'm weary. Scripturally, there is a difference. Now, hey, if you're one of these Christians that any Bible will do, well, yeah, it's your preference, then anything I'm saying to you, or excuse me, anything the Scriptures, the Lord saying to you through the Scriptures, means nothing to you because you are your own standard. And you'll go to, like a whore, you'll go to anything just to fulfill yourself. You are claiming a perfect standard. What do you do? How he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Emelech from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Now, the very first appearance of any variation of as far as not weareth or weary, weareth or wear, but as this as meaning to exhaustion, being spent, okay? We go to Genesis 19, and 
the Lord in this, and we're not going to address this today because this this is um, the Lord did something else with this, um, which just he he took it off. It's like, wow, dude. We're going to address that in a different video. I'm talking about Genesis 19 verse 11. The Lord with and I love when the Lord will have a dissection of just one verse where you go through just one verse and you can spend two hours just dissecting cleaning getting the jewels and looking at the facets of that jewel of scripture you know uh, I love that and he did that when we came to Genesis 1911 we're going to address that in another video but I want to we, we have to here um, Genesis 19 Verses 10 on to verse 11. Okay, this is the first appearance of this variation. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the, shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. That's so beautiful. You can we and we will, okay? Now like I said, wear like in wear and tear, you wear something or wear the stones, weareth same principle. Okay? That's that is a different thing than this. Okay? Even though the root things are the same. Okay? All right? We we're not a we're not addressing that. Okay? But wearied themselves to find the door. Spent themselves. Exhausted themselves. People would say tired themselves. But scripturally, tired, tired, tires has nothing to do with being weary. Nothing. Nothing at all. Wearieth. Now, like I said, in another video coming, Lord willing, got the little... <laughs> Works cut out for me, okay? But uh, got, you know, whatever. Verse 11, Genesis 19, 11. There's going to be something on that. Because you look at that verse, saints, and you'd be like, ooh, door, blindness. Wow. Weary. Door. Oh. Yeah. You can glean and get fed with that one verse. But we'll, we'll, that'll be another video. Okay? Alright. Job 37. Job 37. Wearieth. Verse 13. Wearieth. Job 37. It just passed. When a set of scripture finally gets to that point where they're just broken, right? And they, they the pages become almost almost cloth like velvety almost you know what I'm saying Job 37 verse 11 uh, actually verses 10 on to verse 12 by the breath of God frost is given and the breath of the waters is straight also by watering he wearieth the thick cloud he scattereth his bright cloud and it is turned round about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world and the earth. So by watering he wearieth the thick clouds. And the cl thick clouds, what do they do when they are wearied? They empty themselves. They rain on us. Okay? Okay? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. What are you, what are you doing? Man? Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Oh, let's begin at verse 12 on to verse 15. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. Wise man, someone who fears the Lord. But the lips of a fool who says... In his heart there is no God will swallow up himself. I think right away of stupid head. Uh, Christy Burke. Mark the messenger. And, uh, um, that, that lying heart guy. And, uh, 
uh, that Mr. Murphy guy too. Okay, yeah, fools. Okay, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, speaking, behaving as if you say in your heart there is no God. And the end of his talk is mischievous madness. You haven't given any evidence that your God exists. Uh, there's a plethora effect of evidence to prove that God is. You just don't want to believe it. And like I said, as far as Mr. Murphy is concerned, I give him that respect. He acknowledged that. He acknowledged that. It's like, you're right. He, I mean, he didn't verbally, but he, he acknowledged. Because I said to him, like I said, if the Lord, if the Lord Jesus himself, if Jesus himself appeared before you, you wouldn't believe him anyway. He gave a heart to that. Saying, yeah, you're right, I wouldn't. Okay? So, we'll see, and see, with someone like that, fine. I know where you stand. Like I told him, I'm not even going to waste time witnessing to you. Because you don't want to hear it. And you have admitted you don't want to hear it. So, okay. All right, good luck at the great white throne. Okay, go ahead. All right? Now I'm going to waste time. All right? Okay? A fool is also full of words. Like so many of these woke people. A man cannot tell what shall be. And what shall be after him, who can tell him? The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them. Because they know they knoweth not how to go to the city. And interestingly enough, this verse was the catalyst for that discussion. Because look at that verse. The foolish say, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Oh, foolish is someone behaving, acting, speaking as if there is no God. And that clearly wearies the individual, the fool. Okay, and a fool who says in his heart there is no God, who behaves foolishly, they know not how to go to the city. The New Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Synonymous where God is. Meaning, fools, foolish, here, what this is talking about, don't know how to go to God. Or rather, they don't want to. As we already addressed. This video. Okay. Oh, uh, weariness, weariness, weariness. Ecclesiastes twelve unto fourteen. Uh, uh, you know what? Let's add eleven. Eleven on to verse fourteen. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Oh, you can go in so many directions. The nails, and the shepherd, uh, wise, and masters. I mean, you can go off on, for hours on that one verse alone, too. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end, and much Study is a weariness of the flesh. I'll sit here for two, three hours with Scripture. My wife, you know, because we, we, we do our reading separately, she'll do the same thing. Your flesh wants to, I don't want to sit here and do this. Okay? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You look over at uh, verse 9 in chapter 11. Rejoice, O young man, in thy heart, and let thy heart cheer thee. Oh, excuse me. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. <laughs> excuse me. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. And every one of us is going to give an account of himself to God. That includes you atheists too. Malachi. 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 That's your fault. 
the day you told me that, it's like, ah! <laughs> Malachi, chapter 1, verses 12 on to verse 14 for a little context. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Well, there is no perfect standard, so it's, it's what's your preference? Preference. Preference has nothing to do with it. Okay, that, that twit, Bible, flock, box, guy, he did that thing, uh, that's on the other channel. It's like, well, it's a matter of your preference. I, I gotta remember that. Flock, that, that guy, he's Seventh-day, um, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, that guy's crazy. But he's like, hey, find a Bible that suits you. you. You are your own God. You are your own standard. This, ha this has nothing to do with my preference. Preference has nothing to do with it. This is God's perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration word. My preference has nothing to do with it. This is what he has preserved. Period. Period. Okay? And if it is a matter of preference, then you are your own standard. <coughs> Verse 13. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it, and ye have snuffed at it. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Sat the Lord of hosts, and ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick, Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, said the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, which hath a flock, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Look in your margin if there's a reference for uh, kings, where uh, Nathan went to David with how... The one guy spared to take of his own flock, but took the little ooh lamb. Look for a reference in there in the margin. For your own whatever. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Oh, let's... Let's read... Verses 23 on to verse 30. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Why was Paul speaking like a fool? Or as a fool, excuse me. Uh, because he was being barraged. He was being harassed. He was being questioned. And it got to the point where Paul, he's like, okay, you come okay I, I all right I, I, I okay you guys leave me no choice all right that's what our enemies want to bring out of us and in doing that we'd be like Paul's like okay I have to but see you got to watch out for our enemies and that's why don't engage them and remember study how people put things together there's a certain thing that you can learn about, about uh, writing from old time that teaches you how you can spot people, how they use words and sentence structure to finger them almost every single time when they think they're being so clever, being the, they, they think they're hiding under a sock account as they call it nowadays, when it's like, dude, I know that's you. Pull your head out from betwixt your buttocks and at least have the stones to admit it's you, because I know it's you. Okay? Never mind. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I, sh I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, 
and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils of the in the sea, and perils among false brethren, Christians. Okay? In weariness. Look at what we just covered up to that appearance of that word. In and painfulness and watchings often. In hunger and thirst and fastings often. Oh, he was going speedily. No. Remember, scripturally, fast has nothing to do with speed. Nothing. In cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended and I bear not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. Look right across your page if it is that way. Uh, verse 9 in chapter 12, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I most most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I then am I strong. And why is that? Because the source of our strength is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost that dwells within us. So, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. There's one more. One more. Sorry. Job 7. Then we'll be done. Then we'll be done. Okay. Job 7. Just one verse. Just one verse. Come on. Like I said, when you get a set of scriptures where they're just just at that spot where they're perfectly worn in. All right. Oh, let's read verses 1. On to verse 7, and then we'll be done. Is there not an appointed time to man upon earth? Are not his days also like the days of an hireling? There's another good evidence right there that um, this that Job is after the flood. As a servant earnestly desireth the shadow, and as an hireling looketh for the reward of his work, so, uh, I, so am I made to possess months of vanity, and wearisome nights are appointed to me. <laughs> when I lie down, I say, When shall I arise? And the night be gone. And I am full of tossings to and fro, unto the dawning of the day. And you tie that in with the context there. My flesh is clothed with worms and clouds of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eyes shall no more see good. Let's read for a second. The eye of him that hath seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. So, no, you're not going to go to hell if you don't take heed to these things. But you know, you King James Bible Christians out there, dude, isn't there enough watering down? Isn't there, well, isn't there enough of this, well, it's not, well, 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 is, isn't there enough of that? You saints who trust this, you saints, you claim this is the perfect standard. Why aren't you making an attempt, at least? Why? It's not a doctrinal issue. Funny. A lot of people who say that also will do that to defend being a Roman Catholic for a day. 
funny, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you for watching this, if you do. Um, and, brother, thank you. Thank you. I told you. I wanted to do it yesterday, but uh, things happened. Things happened. Going to get this uploaded. There will be a few dis uh, videos for you in the description box. Um, consider this, at least. At least. We have a perfect standard. And the perfect standard has just revealed that tired, as we often use it, is not how God used it. And whose word will endure forever? <laughs>